Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Um, I I'm deciding not to use the microphone because um, I started out teaching biology 101, and so I think I have a pretty loud voice. Um, but if it's a problem, just you know, raise your hand, and I'll put on the microphone um, um, for the benefit of being able to hear you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Um, what I decided to do um, in these talks, because there's two talks, is in the first one, I decided um, because I have this passion to think that people need to be able to read the New York Times and understand what they read in the New York Times because we're all interested in that. I mean, that's I read the New York Times to find out um, what is the hot stuff going on. And so in the first talk, I wanted to convey a few principles about the brain and about neurons and then about neurodegenerative disease that I think are sort of principles to know. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of t treating you as um, my class in neurological disease. And what are those things that I think you should understand or appreciate about the brain um, in order to understand um, what you read in the paper and where science is going today? Um, and I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about touches on many of the points that have been made um, particularly by Reverend Himes about um, technology and by Guy about technology and how things have changed um, because it's just the same um, in my field. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out is like if you were to ask 200 different neuroscientists to give these talks, you'd get 200 different talks. Okay, so and I and, and I, you know what I could have probably come up with 200 different talks myself. Okay, so um, so this is kind of an experiment for me to see, you know. If I think about, you know, what do I want, you know, my friends and family to know about the brain? So um, we'll see if it works. Okay. And first, I wanted to acknowledge some of the sources that I used um, for for um, for some of the images and the pictures and the the ideas. Some of these are very general ideas. I'm going to tell you that I've never really studied myself, but I know in being a neuroscientist. Scientist. And you can see actually. So some of the key books that I think are particularly good are Kendall's book on the principles of neural science um, and the bear book, but there are many other um, books. And notice how thick these books are, OK? So the brain is a very complex, deep um, structure with many different dynamic aspects to it. So um, I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is open a window to you so that you understand it. And potentially, I'm going to tell you things that you already know. And the other thing, I'm probably going to tell you the same thing um, this, um, different ways, multiple times, so that I can get those points across. Um, so the, what I was going to do in this first one is talk about um, just little mini things of a few different points. One is just why is the brain so fascinating? So why is it the subject? I mean, so many people go in and study the brain, and they switch into the brain. Um, and um, second are, you know, what are, you know, neurons are the cells that, make up the brain or one of the two sets of cells. And what is it about them that, that allows them to um, connect the way that they do and allow the brain to function the way that they do? Because they have some, some different properties. And some of those properties actually make them particularly susceptible to disease. Um, then I was going to tell you sort of what are those things that I have learned in studying neurodegenerative disease. So I call these principles of neurodegenerative disease. They're things that I just learned by doing this work, some of the principles that I found that nobody ever really explains to you. They're rather self-evident, um, but um, they're important points, I think. And then um, my work in particular, and a lot of work that you hear about now, um, you addresses the molecular basis of the process in the brain. Um, and actually, we live in an incredible age. I think probably everybody, you know, hearing these talks, everybody lived in an incredible age. We do too. And we've lived in the age when the genome was sequenced, right? So um, we now know all the genes. And what we're trying to do is get a molecular insight 
into how the brain works. And asking about disease is actually one of the most amazing ways to understand how it really works. In fact, I think it works better than a classical approach of just doing loss of function um, approaches. And, and by the way, human genetics is fascinating. It's one of the most fascinating topics in the world. OK, so when I, you know, I went into neuroscience um, because I took a psychology class as an undergraduate at Princeton. And I was really interested, you know, in behavior. And of course, you know, this is a picture of the brain. This is a fancy one now where they've do, done um, fancy computer analysis of a number of um, images throughout the brain. And really what that highlights is a whole bunch of tracks, those sort of pipes, each one of which is you know, a million neurons, the projections of a million neurons. Well, what the brain is, is a bunch of connections between different parts um, of the brain. What they're not showing here are the actual cell bodies, so the brain of each neuron, which is on the cortex that surrounds um, this massive network um, of connections. And I think, you know, when, when I think, why did I become interested in the brain, and then I read these books, and all the books have the same um, quote at the beginning attributed to Hippocrates um, ages and ages ago. So people have been thinking about the brain from, you know, ages ago, and, and this is, you know, the case, right, from the brain and from the brain only arise our pleasures, our joys, laughter and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, grief, and tears. So who we are comes from our brain. Right? And I became particularly interested in it's the same thing which makes us mad or delirious, inspires us with dread or fear. At the time, I was particularly interested um, in, in diseases of the brain like schizophrenia or even things that are sort of outside of the normal parameter, like people who can write symphonies, a Mozart, you know, and an Einstein. Where do they come from? Where's, what is it? How do you encode that in a brain? in terms of that. And so, um, so I wanted to sort of illustrate how people, how neuroscientists think about it now um, in terms of trying to understand the brain using you know, one of the sexiest <laughs> things that we can do, um, which is language. Okay, I'm not an expert in language, but I think I can convey to you um, one of the major principles with ha about how the brain works from um, describing this. And this comes from, um, from the study of speech disorders or aphasia. And so actually, um, the, the ideas about the brain have jumped in between the br everything comes out of the brain as a whole um, or this kind of view where different functions are mapping to different parts of the brain. And so it was really Broca's work in the study of aphasias, these speech disorders, which people studied from um, either epilepsy situations or stroke. So again, disorders, dis, di, dis, diseases or dysfunction of the brain is when you get insight into the brain. Um, and Broca found in 1861 that this a patient that he had who could understand language so they could understand what they could hear, but they couldn't speak appropriately. And yet they had vocal cords and they had um, everything, every, all the anatomy that they should have to do that, and yet they couldn't speak. And when he did the analysis of that brain, um, after the individual passed away, he was able to discover that that individual was defective in one particular region of the brain. Um, and he studied eight more patients, and they all had defects in this one region, which was a phenomenal finding. So this function, this ability to speak in response to language, was mapping to a particular region in the brain, which we now know as Broca's area. Okay, so then um, this next insight was made um, subs um, later by Wernicke in 1876. 
So Wernicke studied another type of individual who had a speech disorder. And this individual, these patients can speak just fine. They can make great sentences, but they have no connection to language. So they don't, they can't hear what they're hearing properly so that they, the speech center is okay, but they can't, um, when they hear something, they're not, they're not um, synthesizing it and making it right. So these individuals had a completely different type of disorder, and he found that they mapped to a different region of the brain, which we now know as Wernicke's area. Okay, now what was, um, what was a real advance was when Wernicke and his colleagues then knowing these types of studies and some other studies that were going on, they, he came up with the idea, Wernicke and colleagues came up with the idea that um, different functions are mapping to different regions of the brain, but it's actually the connections between those regions. So how those cells are projecting and connecting to other cells um, that is giving the more complex brain functions. Okay, so it's not only the regions of the brain that have that function, but it's how they're connected that are giving us these higher functions. And moreover, he predicted that there would then be at least one other type of aphasia. He predicted a third type of patient, and this patient should be defective in the fibers that are connecting Wernicke's area to Broca's area. So these individuals who were subsequently found, right, are individuals who can understand language and who can speak language, except they use the completely inappropriate use of words. And moreover, they're completely aware of it. Okay. So this underscores this really important thing about the brain and that's driving, um, as I'm going to tell you, it's driving the brain initiative right now. So I feel like I'm going to hit all the things that you read about in the news. Okay, so um, it isn't just those regions that you can map um, particular functions about the brain, but it's how they're connected um, dynamically that make these more complex um, activities that we have. So the whole idea behind the Brain Initiative, which was announced by Obama in 2014, um, is to create a functional map with the ultimate goal of this functional map of the human brain in order to image what's going on, to record what's going on, and to, in fact, ultimately control neurons, control activity. And you can imagine how that, you know, for spinal cord injury and such, um, or very devastating diseases where you lose the ability to move to control those neurons. Now, the BRAIN initiative, BRAIN, stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. <laughs> Technology. There it is. Okay, so just like in, in many of the other um, areas and sciences we've talked about, the idea that people have is that technology is going to drive understanding, right? So this is all about coming up with new ways that we can see how neurons are interconnecting, how they function, how they have activity. And through that, the hope is that we're going to get to this elusive understanding of how the brain works. I mean, in fact, how individual brain cells and complex neural circuits, so those are the circuits, the connections between the brains, interact at the speed of thought. Okay, that's where that's going. Okay. Okay. So, so now I want to sort of introduce you to neurons. Okay, so it's neurons and actually glia that are the cells that make up the brain. And I want to um, convey to you some of their simple properties that make them so special, um, but that also make them susceptible to disease. So, um, so when, why is it, what is it about them? What are the weak links, the Achilles heels um, in these um, cells? I'm just gonna highlight a few. I'm sure they have lots of them, but, um, and I'm gonna talk about a few aspects of them. So um, this, these are showing diagrams. So the, the two people who um, opened up 
um, an understanding of the cells of the brain were Golgi with a staining technique that I'm about to show you. But then Ramoni Cajal, who then looked at brain tissue in, in many different um, organisms, in cute, including humans, and made very beautiful diagrams and structures, and was the first person to really gain a deep understanding um, of the cells of the brain. And by just looking at that, he actually made amazing functional implications for how the brain works. And this just shows you some of those. Um, I'm going to talk um, about in more detail, you know, your classic neuron is sort of this pyramidal, so-called pyramidal cell neuron. I'll talk about it in a minute. But you can see these are neurons that are actually present in our cerebellum, this region, and the elaborate trees um, of input that these neurons have. You know, these Purkinje cells might take input in from 150,000 other cells. Okay, they're that um, elaborate. Okay, so Golgi, um, the technique that um, that Cajal used was to stain um, sections and to visualize them with a microscope. <clears throat> um, and this Golgi method that Golgi um, um, developed turns out to um, precipitate silver in the cells. And well, the, the thing that's so um, amazing about it and that allowed Ramoni Cajal to make his observations was that the silver deposits all the way along the cell. So neurons are incredibly long and elaborate cells, and yet the entire cell would fill up um, with silver. So you could see the entire structure. Moreover, only about 1% of the cells would do that. So here's a section probably loaded you know, with a 1,000 neurons, and yet we're just seeing a few of them, but we're seeing them in a way that we can see their entire structure. So if we look at, you know, sort of the schematic of a neuron, um, there are some, uh, I'm going to emphasize in the next two slides, some of the features of neurons that are so important um, that are, and that are the functional aspects of them. So um, the neuron, a neuron has its cell body. Here's its cell body. And these, there's the cell body. It's in this, this these are so-called parameter cells because it looks like, you know, a triangle. Um, and, of course, in the main body of the neuron is the nucleus. And in the nucleus, of course, is the DNA that directs all the activities of that cell. Um, so that's the so-called soma of the cell. And then it has an elaborate um, um, area of so-called dendrites. These are these tree-like structures from which that neuron is getting information from other neurons. Okay, so it has all of these dendrites at one end, and then it synthesizes the information that comes in from those dendrites, and it sends it out um, an axon. So it has a, every neuron has a single axon, and that axon projects out to its target. It's going to um, another cell, either another neuron, or it could be like a, another type of target, like a muscle or um, in your skin or something like that, um, where it then is communicating its signal. Um, and what you can't see here, you'll see on the next slide, so these axons, sometimes they have branches that come out, is where it releases its message, um, which is a chemical message. So neurons are polar, right? Information comes in at this end, and then it leaves out at that end, right? So it has a directionality to it. Okay, here again, so neurons are these polarized cells. They have all these big branches of dendritic branches, and then they um, sum up signals and they send out a signal. Now, neurons signal electrically. That's what their communication is. So these, the signals that come in here um, are depolarizing that cell. It's a little electrical signal, and it's being um, summed up um, throughout the entire cell, and if that signal is great enough, it's going to trigger an all or none event that's going to go down the axon, and that's called an action potential. Okay, and that signal is then going to travel all the way down that axon to the next set of cells. <clears throat> 
So here you can see this is the um, axon of a previous cell. And when it reaches its target, and it can have 1,000 targets, right? it's going to branch out where it's going to have a synapse. So that's where it connects to the next cell in this synapse. OK, so here's the next neuron. Here are its dendrites. So the synapses are ending on the dendrites of the next cell, where it's going to make a signal that can get summed up in this cell. And then it's going to send its electrical potential down here, where this cell is now going to synapse to the next cell. So this is how they're all connected together. Um, and then their connections, even though they signal electrically, um, their way of communicating from one cell to the next is chemical. OK, so this is a blow up of a synapse where you can see the end of the axon. And in here are little vesicles, little packets um, of so-called neurotransmitters. So those are the chemicals that when the action potential invades this, when it makes its way all the way down here and invades this presynaptic terminal region, it's going to depolarize it. Calcium will rush in and cause that synapse, those vesicles, to fuse. That neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across a gap in here. There's a gap between these two and bind to the receptors on the dendrite, right, on the next cell. That's how it happens. And of course, those, so the brain uses those types of neurotransmitter chemicals to communicate. And of course, a lot of the compounds that are used so that you read about, you know, Prozac, um, Xanax, um, other kinds of compounds. What these are that are regulating behavior is they're regulating the neurotransmitters. You know, Aricept, that is something that's given to Alzheimer's patients, it prevents the, de the, um, the turnover of the neurotransmitters that required in the neurons that are dying in Alzheimer's disease. So it's potentiating the ability of that neurotransmitter to act. OK, so that's what a lot of those compounds, those pharmacological compounds are um, that people use um, um, or that are used in various different types um, of diseases and other situations. OK. OK. What's next here? Ah, OK. So I felt like I was on the right track um, in this talk because one thing I was going to show you is um, some of the features that are defective in some of these diseases. And so this is actually a blow up of a small region of a dendrite, so where that information is coming in. And this is normal. And this is a situation like fragile X, so a cognitive impairment situation. Um, so the overall brain um, of normals versus, for example, a fragile X individual looks grossly normal. But in the 70s, it was found that if you look at really high structure like this, you can see that the structure looks abnormal. Now, these little projections that are extending um, along these dendritic trees are called spines. So the spines are where the information is coming in, where the synapse is coming down and coming in. And what's, what they saw in these um, brains of these individuals is that the spines were completely abnormal. They're too long, and there's too many of them. Um, and so the information that's coming into the neurons is not proper. It's, it's not um, being done right. So there's a very um, gross level change in this that's happening during this phase of when um, dendritic spines and this information is being sculpted. Um, and then just this Tuesday, there was another, um, there was a report about in schizophrenia, how they found a gene linked to um, schizophrenia. And in that situation, they also believe that the gene that they've linked to be associated with schizophrenia is, is regulating spines. So an observation of brains of schizophrenics is that they tend to be thinner. And so the implication is that, that those changes are going to lead to fewer numbers of spines that are present. So these, these types of information are the basic ways in which neurons are communicating to each other. And 
um, cognitive changes um, um, are reflected by a big impact in the structure of these cells. Okay. Okay, now here's the other thing. Neurons are really, really long cells. Okay, so, um, so here's my little picture of a neuron. Here's its brain and its dendritic tree. And here is its axon going to its um, projections. So um, um, when a colleague of mine has this way of describing what the neural cell body has to do to regulate this axon in this way. He says, imagine um, a room 30 to 50 feet wide, which is the control center for a 200 mile long pipe that can get as thin as 20 feet in areas. Okay, so that's the complexity. That's what a neurons can be doing. So neurons can be very, very short, like interneurons in the brain. They're just connecting between two neurons. Or they can be very long meters long, um, a meter long in the body. So from the bottom of your spinal cord down to your toes. Um, and so the other thing is that all the proteins that need to be made for this long projection are made in the cell body. They're made up here. And then they have to get transported down that axon. Right? So the cell actually doesn't have the ability to make proteins down here. Um, it has to make them all here. And this so so-called axonal transport mechanisms are used to transport everything that's needed down to the terminal um, of the axon. Um, and moreover, um, it needs to get signals from that target. So neurons need to know that they've gone to the right place. So they get trophic signals from their target that tells them this is the right place for you to be. And that signal has to get all the way back up here. OK, so this is actually a weak link, um, this axonal transport, because it's a really huge, long process. And it can go wrong in different situations. So I wanted to show you a movie of this, but I don't I don't think it works. OK, what I'm going to do is quit this for a minute and show you the movie. OK, so this is a movie that um, my, so this is, um, you'll be able to see it in a minute. So right here is a little line. It's behind there. And in there are fluorescent white dots, which are things that are moving along this axon. This is actually of a fly axon. And I think you can see things are going actually in both directions um, along this axon. So that's you know standard for axons. They need to transport things along um, their projection, their axon region. Now, this is a study that um, I did um, with Larry and his postdoc, um, Shermali Ganawardena, where we were looking at um, the effects of having um, a disease and looking at an axon um, transport. So here's the axon here. And here's this big glob. This is actually um, one of the disease proteins. And I hope what you can see is, although axon transport um, is still happening here. It's much slower. It's really slow um, compared to normal. So you can imagine that that slowed axon transport that week late can have a lot of effects on the terminals um, of these neurons. And so um, in neurodegenerative disease, one of the things that happens is that the neurons start so-called dying back. Their termini are starting to die back um, because they're not getting all the right um, you know, energy, they need mitochondria, they need vesicles, they need, you know, filled with their neurotransmitters, et cetera. And that um, becomes um, difficult um, and compromised. OK, here we go. Let's see where we are. OK. OK. So um, the other thing about, you know, I've talked neurons, 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 neurons are the thing that makes the brain. Well, it turns out that. Um, neurons uh, in the brain, there are a set of cells, and there are multiple types of these, but they're called glial cells. They're helper cells that help and support the neurons. And in fact, glial cells are, are you know, 10 
fold more common than neurons. Um, I have to say glial cells are greatly understudied because their, their role is generally thought to be um, supporting cells of the neurons. Um, so they um, can help um, protect them so in the, if the brain is insulted or in degenerative disease, the glia are trying to protect the neurons. But they probably have a lot more important and active functions that are only just being um, revealed. But some of the roles um, of glia are, um, so the glia are actually insulate the axons. So they put this fatty, fatty uh, membranes around the axons, which myelin, my, so-called myelin, it myelinates them. And that actually allows the signal on the action potential to go very, very fast because it jumps in between um, those myelin um, wraps. So I'm showing here how this, this axon would be wrapped by um, the cells all the way down. Um, and another role that glia do is they help to clear away the neurotransmitter. So when the cell, um, when the neuron um, releases its neurotransmitters, they're going to help um, get rid of it and end that signal <clears throat> so that you want a nice, precise, sharp signal um, happening there. And glia can help do that. And as I said, glia can do uh, probably a lot more roles. And in degenerative disease, you see what's known as gliosis. So lots of glia. glia um, which gets to my other point, unlike neurons, glia have the capacity to divide um, in the brain. So you'll see, you can see a lot of division going on of them. And so this leads me to this point that becomes very important for neurodegenerative disease. So I'm going to say this is the point, and then here's the exception. <laughs> okay? So most neurons are for life. Okay, so um, you, you know, you get your neurons, there's a lot during development, you know, during adolescence, et cetera, your brain is still undergoing sculpting. So you generate more neurons than you need, and then you figure out the ones that are the right ones that have the right targets. Um, and generally, you're left with those neurons. Okay, now you probably heard and you know that that's not completely true because you've heard about stem cells, neural stem cells. So in fact, one of the findings that's happened over the last, um, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so is that in fact, the brain can make small numbers of new cells. So small sets of stem cells, these cells can generate new neurons um, that we now think can be generated and will get incorporated into circuits. But um, but there's not, you know, it's not overwhelming. This is showing from, um, from um, a paper from Frontiers in Systems Neuroscience. This is actually um, a hippocampal region, which is a region involved in learning and memory. And you, these green is marking new cells that have appeared, this is a, from the rat, um, over three months. So you can see that some cells can indeed um, get generated. And there's a lot of work on, you know, are those cells are, are getting functionally incorporated into circuits? So are they really functional, et cetera? So there are some sets of stem cells, and you hear a lot, I pay attention to this, exercise will boost your stem cells, okay, in terms of that, that you can, you know, and there, this is probably built in here, you know, for learning and memory. So you have the capacity for some type um, of generating new cells. But in general, for neurodegenerative disease, um, at least now, <laughs> we're, uh, you, know, the, I, you know, I think science is trying to work towards the goal that you could rebuild all those neurons that go in your frontal cortex when you have Alzheimer's, but we're a long way from there. Your, your body can't do that um, right now. OK. OK. So that leads me to. This, what are the principles of neurodegenerative disease? So um, I want to highlight some of these things. And as I said, some of them are very obvious, you know, when you think about it, well, of course. Um, but still, I'm going to um, tell, tell you about them. Uh, nobody told them to me. I, <laughs> so I'm like, well, you know, OK. So of course. OK, the clinical phenotype. So that means the phenotype, when you go to the doctor and you're complaining about whatever, um, that reflects functional defects right, in particular neural types right, that are in a particular region of the brain. 
Okay, I'm going to highlight some of the key regions and diseases that you hear about all the time. Um, and that's what makes Alzheimer's disease different from uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay, so it's different neurons that are being affected, um, leading to a different outcome. Okay, so neurons are dying, they're becoming dysfunctional, and they're dying in neurodegenerative disease. And neurons are not easily replaced. Okay, so the problem here, or that challenge here, okay, is that, um, you know, curing, treating neurodegenerative disease is, in my mind, fundamentally different from attacking a disease like cancer. Okay, in cancer, a cells are undergoing unlimited division, right? And still, to this day, the most effective way to treat cancer is to get rid of those cells, okay? Just wipe them out of the body by whatever means, okay? Now, you cannot do that in neurodegenerative disease. What you're trying to do, what the ultimate goal will be, will be to try to make dysfunctional or sick cells functional or better, right? Or replace them with entirely new cells. I mean, to do that is very, very um, hard. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's going to be much harder, I think, um, in terms of that. But there are some ways um, where you, know, you can see where science is going to try to make that kind of thing happen. OK, so one thing is that often the phenotype, so the person doesn't go to the doctor now until most of the neurons in the brain structure that have been hit have already become dysfunctional or degenerated. You know, they say something like 90% gone or dysfunctional. Okay, and then um, a side note is as the disease progresses, it can be very specific early on, but the disease become more widespread throughout the brain and you'll get more broader um, features. Okay, but that means that, um, that um, when the t at the time when the person currently, um, if you say, you know, all things being equal, walks into the clinic, you're in, that's a very bad state already. Right, 90% gone, 90% um, dysfunctional, right? Okay. So, and current treatment, of course, as you know, um, is directed toward, for degenerative type and neurological diseases, right, hitting the symptoms, right? I can't move, okay, I want to move better, not the cause, not keeping those cells alive, right? Um, and so a major goal of science, right, is to try to figure out, are there ways that we can identify when this disease is coming long before that time? Right? Can we get to a point where we can treat the cause or just delay the disease? Right? All you have to do is delay it long enough um, so that you never hit right, this 90% um, stage. Right? That would go a long way in making a huge difference to the life um, of a lot of people. Okay. Uh, so this is something that I've learned in the course of my studies. Um, that, of course, in medicine, um, the goal of clinical medicine is to try to figure out very specifically what is the symptom that you have to treat it very specifically. Um, and that's so that you can treat that symptom and not get side effects or other effects. Okay, now in contrast to that, which will become apparent um, when I talk about my research, um, that the findings from research that have come out over the last um, you know, 15 years or so is that these different degenerative diseases actually share many mechanisms. There are things that are very much the same in all of them, saying that if you could treat it at a different point, if you could treat the cause, you could ha treat the cause commonly, right? Because they're all due to, or many of them, nearly all of them, are due to so-called protein misfolding, okay? Which is what I'm going to tell you about, okay? Uh, so this is something else. <laughs> so, um, so note that many neurodegenerative diseases are only definitively determined right, after the tissue is examined. 
Okay. So, um, and it will have to be this way until, you know, you, as you're probably aware of many different types um, of advances where they're for trying to visualize Alzheimer's plaques in the brain of living individuals, right? Because currently, um, the way to know if somebody really has Alzheimer's, and by the way, Alzheimer's is defined as having Alzheimer's plaques and tangles, right? So the only way to know that is to look at the tissue, okay, in terms of that. So one of the goals is to generate, is to get these other visualization techniques in the living brain to ask, does the individual have plaques and tangles? So those are some of the most exciting types of non-invasive probes that are being generated. Um, and that way, the idea is, can we tell if this person is going to get the disease, right? You want to know long before they have the disease whether they're going to get it because though, that's the time when it's going to be most successful treating it. Okay. Ah, so that's why you often hear it's probable Alzheimer's disease or clinical Alzheimer's disease. It's clinical until you can tell at the pathological level. Okay, and then finally, oh, so this is a big issue um, that's really interesting issue <laughs> because age is the number one risk factor for all neurodegenerative diseases, right? So if you live long enough, you're going to get Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, so, um, and the question is, you know, how different, is aging something different from neurodegenerative disease? Okay, so is Alzheimer's disease really a disease? Right? Or is it the terminal outcome of an aging brain? Right? Because these changes that happen, so this, you know, these um, so-called mild cognitive impairments, sort of forgetting where you put your keys or seeing someone and forgetting their name, you know, these are features also of aging. Right? And they become more extreme and much, much worse, leading to very extreme changes in Alzheimer's. But do those changes always lead to Alzheimer's, or is, or is there something fundamentally different um, in those two? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now I wanted to, you know, emphasize a few of these things by um, by talking about the regions of the brain and just tell you these are some of the biggies, okay, that people study, and um, and these are the regions of the brain that are def that um, are affected by those. And so if we look at the brain, it's, it, it's been Different regions of the brain have different names and they're involved in different functions. And so this is a map where they've put on different, you know, the types of functions that map to those different regions of the brain. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common neurodegenerative disease. In Alzheimer's disease, what they call the prefrontal lobe, that means the front part of the front of the brain, right? Um, and short-term memory center. So we all know that Alzheimer's disease is a memory disorder. You forget things. Um, and that's in a region that's it's in the temporal lobe that's here, the hippocampus. Um, and it affects memory and judgment. So Alzheimer's disease typically starts at 65 or older, about, um, uh, let's see, 5 to 10% of people, maybe 65, and then about half of people over 85 have Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a progressive disease. Now, there are, there are some other diseases that are really um, aggressively studied diseases right now, mostly because of making um, insights into the, the genes that are involved. And then the second most common dementia, that is, you know, um, memory disorder, is called FTD, frontotemporal dementia. Now, FTD presents slightly differently because it starts in this region of the brain. So it starts with emotion and language deficits as well as short-term memory um, and spreads to the frontal cortex, so problem solving, reasoning, et cetera. Now, the difference between FTD and AD can often be difficult, so that's why you can't really tell until you do pathological examination of the brain. However, FTD typically has an earlier onset than Alzheimer's, um, and it starts with different features, with personality changes, um, language difficulties in terms of that. Um, um, the disease that we first started um, modeling in flies was actually um, a 
and ataxia. Ataxia means lack of coordinated movement. Um, and so this includes many of a set of diseases that are known as polyglutamine diseases because they have a big run of the amino acid glutamine. And they're typically associated with um, defects in the movement centers of the brain. A disease that's also getting a lot of attention now is um, ALS, so amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So um, ALS um, is a frequency of about 1 in 50,000 or so. Um, and it leads to loss of motor neurons that are up here in the motor cortex as well as along the spinal cord. So you lose the ability um, to move. Um, now ALS is shares um, some genes with FTD. So you often see FTD and ALS segregating um, in families. Um, and it's a very interesting to ask why is that the case. Okay, I, Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder. So Parkinson's disease starts with tremors and the inability um, to make voluntary movement control. And it, you often hear it's, it's primarily due to loss of a particular type of neuron, dopaminergic neurons, in a motor center that's deep um, within the brain. So and often in Parkinson's disease, not always, um, because as I said, sometimes these diseases start very locally and then they get more global. So um, the brain can be completely cognitively fine in Parkinson's disease or ALS, um, and yet um, you can't move. I mean, it's really a frightening type of situation. Okay, so I just wanted to, um, let's see, very briefly, because it touches on another thing that Regmund Himes talked about, just um, emphasize some of these points with Alzheimer's. So, uh, so how was Alzheimer's discovered? Well, it was first recognized by um, Dr. Alzheimer studying a particular patient. Um, and he ended up writing about this patient um, in 1906. But his goal had been to help the science of psychiatry, right, these behavioral disorders with the microscope. So he wanted, so psychiatry was a really big science at the time, trying to understand behavior. Um, but he wanted to say, can we make any anatomical correlates? Well, um, he studied this patient called Auguste D, who, um, who started with um, abnormal behaviors um, when she, with paranoia and memory issues that really rapidly progressed. So um, within months, she had to be, she was entered into a clinic and she very rapidly progressed to very full-blown um, dementia. Um, at the end, you know, she was apathetic, you know, without, um, um, you know, knowing what was going on and confined to a bed. In fact, in Alzheimer's, you sort of revert to a childlike state. You can't do um, um, any of your normal tasks. Um, so she, in fact, it, now we think had one of the very aggressive mutations um, that causes Alzheimer's disease. But again, the real insight was that um, was that Alzheimer wanted the brain. So he had studied um, this patient when he was in Frankfurt. He had moved to Munich. And when he saw that brain, he said, I want that brain. <laughs> okay? And when he saw that brain, he found a brain unlike anything he had ever seen before. And that was the real turning point. He described you know, what are the hallmark pathologies um, of Alzheimer's disease. These are some of his um, figures. But Alzheimer's disease is characterized by so-called plaques, these big um, regions, unknown material, large plaques throughout the brain. He said massive numbers of neurons had died. Okay, so the brain didn't look anything like normal. Lots of glia. The brain is reacting. It knows that something's wrong here. And he found these tangles. These are the neural tangles that characterize um, Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, this was what gave the insight, her brain was unlike anything he had ever seen before. And this sort of, um, this is an image, um, I can't credit it because I can't remember where I got it from, but, but this sort of shows you what I'm trying to say. So probably, 
Changes for Alzheimer's disease brain are starting decades before you have any insight that the person is going to get Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then you start seeing changes. Um, and then it's like a very rapid decline. So well, in Alzheimer's disease, it's like 10 to 20 years. That's not rapid enough to intervene very um, rapidly with therapeutics, um, meaning for clinical studies. Um, but, um, but here's like normal age-related memory loss. So, you know, um, again, is Alzheimer's a disease or is it just, you know, normal aging? Okay. So I just wanted to end um, by, by emphasizing again the thing that made the difference to my work is having the genes, right? So, um, so and that is because pe of a few things. So one is um, people kept very careful pedigrees. So following disease in families. Um, and this is showing um, a pedigree from um, Wiki Commons where you can see the individual with the disease is, has, is the dark color and you can see how the disease is being passed down through generations. And of course, um, um, the huge impact in this came with um, Mendel, right, who we are going to hear about tomorrow, of course. So is Mendel, you know, again, emphasizing the biggest discoveries come where you don't know where, <laughs> okay, studying pea plants, right, came up with the basic laws um, that regulate our genes and how they are distributed. Um, and so we, th the first types um, of genes were cloned in the golden era of molecular um, genetics. And those were all so-called Mendelian disorders. That's what they call them. They're, so they're single gene traits that can be followed. And, um, and so having a great pe pedigree is instrumental in being able to do this. And it was um, Mendel who use the words, you know, recessive and dominant for different traits. So do you need two copies to see the disease or just one? And I should emphasize one reason why neurodegenerative disease can be really hard is you just need one copy, right? You, so it's much easier when you're cloning to look for defects in two of the same ones and match them up than for just a defect in one. Okay, but human genetics also throws you a lot of punches that you don't see um, with other, I mean, you do see in other situations, but in a lab, you control those things. Are these things about penetrance and expressivity? So penetrance, you know, not all the individuals that have the gene will show the mutation. Um, and sometimes the mutation can look like different things in different people. So in a pedigree where some individuals have Alzheimer's disease, some other other individuals might just have mild cognitive impairment. Um, and for a degenerative disease, you also have age on top of that. So you won't see it until they're old enough, right? So you don't know um, whether they're going to have the disease until you, know, you clone the gene if they allow you to do that. Okay, so here's an example of you know some of those complexities. So here are, are clearly they must have passed on this gene. So what's going on in this pedigree? Um, is this a recessive trait, meaning you need two copies, or is there incomplete penetrance? You know, and this really matters when you start looking at the DNA and cloning um, in terms of that. Okay, <clears throat> so. Um, we live, as I said, in this amazing age where we know our sequence. We know the sequence of all the genes. Um, and, um, and so we can now you know, um, probe our genome in a way that just wasn't possible before. Um, and so the genes, of course, are the basic unit of inheritance. Um, it's, a, it's at a specific site on a chromosome, um, which is all the DNA in all its little packaging. <laughs> um, and then um, the genes can exist in different forms. So you can have different alleles of a gene. Um, but actually, once we start sequencing the genome, we can see there are a lot more changes in the DNA than we thought, and we don't necessarily see all of those or know what they mean. Those are, you know, polymorphisms that are seen. And of course, mutations are something, you know, that we know is associated with a phenotype. Um, when people use a term like genotype, the genotype of the individual means what their genes are, right? And their phenotype is what they look like, okay? What, what the, 
what um, the presentation is. And so um, when the major human neurodegenerative disease genes were cloned, um, and these were, you know, the gene that I ended up studying was cloned just about when I first started um, at Penn. Um, they were cloned by um, linkage analysis. What that means is linking um, a trait, the disease, to a particular site on a chromosome. And when we think about um, and we think about diseases, we think of them in two ways. One of them is familial diseases that, you know, the way you can remember, it runs in the family. So that's caused by an inherited gene mutation, right? And the other way is sporadic. So there's no clear family history that you can see, but the individual has um, that trait, whatever it is. Um, now, this could be um, because it has an environmental cause. Um, so, for example, toxins can cause, um, can be a risk factor for Parkinson's disease, for example, or a new mutation. So, sporadic diseases can also be genetic, okay? So, so for example, they can be recessive and you just didn't know it. You didn't know the disease was there. You have these, you know, these tricky things, these incomplete penetrants and variable expressivity. But now we also know that there can be a lot of new mutations, de novo mutations. So a lot of, um, of the work that's done on autism situations, they think those are de novo mutations that happen. Um, but an interesting thing that I wanted to emphasize is that um, um, there's, you know, the, the reason why you have to do linkage analysis is you need to find the gene among all the DNA. So you have the DNA cloned, you just don't know which one is the disease gene that you're interested in. And even now, there's a very heavy reliance. And I, the new types of sequencing that you hear, you hear them, people say it all the time, is next-gen sequencing. They're doing next-gen sequencing. What that means is next generation sequencing. And that next generation refers to the type of chemistry that's being used in the sequencing. So they've gone from the original classic Sanger type sequencing to now these fancier types of techniques that use imaging. But there's still a heavy reliance on pedigree. So for example, in the autism research, they often use so-called trios. That's the mother, the father and the child. And from that, they could tell, is the, does the individual have new mutations or do they have an inherited mutation um, from the parents? Okay, um, and the, just two final points. So one is, um, familial and sp sporadic these can look very similar. Okay, so, um, so in the lab, because in familial disease we have a gene, so we can model it, we use, we use those genes. But we think we're modeling both familial disease and the more general sporadic disease. Um, and last, I just wanted to end on a Manhattan plot because of the schizophrenia study. So if you read that schizophrenia study, they use this word Manhattan plot. They've done this, you know, this analysis on Manhattan plots. So one of the things, once they had the genome that became very, um, um, but people started doing was to, because we have changes in our DNA, each individual has changes in their DNA actually very frequently across the genome. Um, I think it's as frequent as every thousand base pairs. Okay, so that means that you can take a large number of individuals who, who in, in this example, they, they don't have schizophrenia, and a large number of individuals who have schizophrenia, and you can ask, do any of those individuals that have schizophrenia have some of the same changes in DNA? Okay, and this is sort of mapping um, those changes across all the chromosomes. Okay, and this is, you know, whether they're sharing some of those common changes. So this is called a Manhattan plot because it looks like skyscrapers. Um, and so you can, and you know, there's two hypotheses. One is that, sch that schizophrenia, schizophrenics, at least a percentage of them, are all sharing some gene, um, or there's some of them that are sharing one gene, and that's what's causing the disease. Now the alternative, because schizophrenia is actually a very common disease, right? It's one in a hundred or something, is that changes in many, many different genes can cause this same phenotype, right? So 
if the hypothesis is um, that lots of individuals are sharing the same mutation, you could see it as a signal here using statistics. Um, if you don't see any signal, it could simply be because there are many, many different genes that change the neurotransmitters that are needed in schizophrenia, and you can never see them. Each individual can have a different one, right, in terms of that. But in that study about schizophrenia, they talk a lot about, oh, in the Manhattan plot, they finally linked a change to dendritic, that's a protein that works at dendritic spines, is one of the signals underneath this. Because when they find the signal, they actually don't know the gene, they just know that's the area. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this first talk. And then I, in the next one, I was going to sort of tell you about my disease um, or what I've done. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, okay. So um, now I'm going to tell you the kind of work that I did, that well that I did, I'm still doing it, <laughs> okay, but I'm gonna take you through it in terms of that. And the thing that I became interested in, and this is when I started my lab at Penn, um, um, was the question of neurodegenerative diseases. So, you know, these individuals um, died of various different neurodegenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's disease, as you well know, is a dementia, memory mm. disorder and dementia. Um, Huntington's disease is a polyglutamine repeat disease, and I'll talk about that um, again. Um, but it is an ataxia, sort of, sort of walking, you know, like you're drunk. Um, and ALS um, or Lou Gehrig's disease is a very rapidly progressing motor neuron degenerative disease. So um, if you look at these diseases up close and personal as a clinical med medicine person, they're very different. But if you look at them from the point of view of a fly geneticist, which is what I am, um, they all look the same, right? So they're all late onset and progressive neurodegenerative diseases. And in fact, um, we now know, and it was sort of coming out um, as I started my lab, that they're all associated with similar um, type, general class of pathology, which is the accumulation of abnormal um, aggregates. Okay, so um, Alzheimer's disease is associated with the plaques and tangles, those are the classic um, marks of Alzheimer's disease. Um, then it turned out, um, this is like right after I started in the lab around, I, I started my lab in 94 and in 98, um, I think was when, 97 obviously when this was pulled up. Um, it turns out these polyglutamine repeat diseases are also associated with the accumulation um, of polyglutamine protein in the cells, which is seen as these black dots here. Um, and more recently, it's become really um, clear that ALS um, is associated with the abnormal accumulation of um, an RNA binding protein called TDP43, and I'm going to talk more about that later. So that protein is normally a nuclear protein. This, these are the big motor neurons of the spinal cord. Um, it's normally in the nucleus, and then in ALS, it starts spreading out into the cytoplasm, forming these nasty-looking um, accumulations. And of course, Parkinson's disease is characterized by so-called Lewy bodies, which is the accumulation of alpha-synuclein um, right by um, the cell nucleus or in the neurites um, of the neurons. Um, and so um, there's this, you know, if you look at that and you say, well, even though it's different proteins in different situations, um, and I might note that in these situations, the proteins that accumulate abnormally are ones in which there have been found mutations in the rare, in the rare or more common familial forms. Um, it's all due to the abnormal accumulation of protein. So something's going wrong with protein dynamics. So proteins should normally be generated. They have a life. They fold properly, and you get rid of them. And this is a fundamental feature of all of these different diseases. Um, and so I thought, um, given this, you know. Could we, in fact, 
Um, when you think about, you know, you, when you get one of these disease genes, most people model the disease in tissue culture or they model it in a mouse. And, you know, I thought, well, why not just model it in the fly? Okay, um, the fly had just won a Nobel Prize for revealing that the pathways that are involved in fundamental development um, are, some, are the same, <laughs> many of the same pathways that are used um, in human development. So, um, so why couldn't we model a disease like this in the fly just like you can study other pathways? And so that was the idea that we decided to do. So, so why not try the fly? Could we generate these diseases in the fly? Could we figure out then how these diseases are working? And could we figure out how you can do long-term maintenance of the brain? Um, so um, here's a fly looking a little scary, but they're not very scary. They're really cute. Okay, so also why why would you want to do this? What are some other reasons? Well, I knew um, that genes and pathways are really highly conserved um, between flies um, and humans. So in fact, the same genes that are involved in learning and memory in humans are involved in learning and memory in flies. Um, circadian rhythms, this is one of the, one of the most classic, um, um, fascinating sets of genes that were found um, by my postdoctoral advisor, Seymour Benzer. Um, those, those genes that guide our 24-hour rhythms, these are the same used in flies are used in humans. Um, the molecules that are required for building a nervous system, these are the same molecules that are used. Um, um, signaling pathways, when I was a postdoc, um, they were revealing the pathways of genes that are involved in, in making the eye of the fly and actually in making one of the structures in the nematode and um, in the lab next to me. And so um, what they found, which was stunning to them, is that the genes that are required to make an eye are genes that go mutant in cancer. So RAS and RAF, all of these types of genes are actually have a normal role in development um, and you could figure out their pathway by studying a system like the fly. And other genes, like genes of the innate immune system, these were first revealed um, from flies. So we said, well, if you can study all of those things, why can't we study um, disease, brain disease in the fly? And so the fly actually has a very complex brain. It has functional regions, just like the mammalian brain. Um, and I was going to sort of illustrate. Um, it's sort of hard to see here, but in green are highlighting from a paper of Frank Hurt. Hearth, some of the neurons that are involved, the dopaminergic neurons that are present in the fly brain. So the fly has a very complex brain. A lot of the brain is visual systems, but um, the fly has a lot of very complex, sophisticated um, behaviors. Um, and they can walk on the ceiling, and we can't. Let's put it that way. <laughs> 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 okay, but the, the true, uh, the other reason to use a fly um, that I'll show you is that um, relative to us, the fly has a really fast life cycle. So it only takes 10 days to go from an egg to the adult animal. In the adult, the adult sort of a day in the fly is sort of like a year for us. So flies live between yeah. 60 and 90 um, days. Um, you can get large numbers of progenies. It's, I call it, everything is relative. So it's relatively inexpensive to grow. Um, and, but the real you know, powers that there are unbelievable number of tools for manipulating genes. And those just, you know, due to the very collaborative and interactive active um, fly community, those are generated and shared um, among um, people to, to do all kinds of things. And so this is sort of our game plan. Um, so, um, so when I started my lab, my, you know, I was working on my bread and butter project. And um, because I was at Penn, and Penn is a very collaborative environment, I had met um, when I interviewed at Penn um, some of the people who cloned some of the basic human neurodegenerative disease genes. And, you know, when I said, hey, why don't we put this into the fly, they said, yeah. Oops. <laughs> Just like that. 
Okay, in particular, one person in particular, Kurt Fishbeck, was really, he's down at the NIH now. Um, he was really enthusiastic and positive about it. It made a really big difference. So the idea is to take the human disease gene um, and use fly genetic tools. So in the fly, you can either um, upregulate a gene or downregulate a gene. What we did is put in the gene. So we put in the human disease gene. This is supposed to be a fly with that. And then what we can do, whoops, what we can do in the fly, we have the tools to direct that gene to different tissues of the fly to try to make a model for the human disease. So we often express it in the eye, and the reason is that the eye is a non-vital tissue, so you can get animals that have the phenotype in the eye, they're alive, um, but you can look at them and you can do genetics with that. I'll show you how you do that. Um, but you can also do things like express it throughout the entire brain and ask what the phenotype is, what the effect is of that gene, or express it in the motor neurons that make the fly move, right? For a movement disorder, um, does the fly have problems with that? Um, and so with that, you can then say, you characterize that and say, aha, I've created a fly model of this human disease. And so then what do you do with that? Um, well, you can then study, to try to understand that disease um, to reveal how is that protein, how is that gene causing disease. Um, but the real power, of course, is that you can manipulate that fly in very powerful ways to make a fly that's better in that disease so that you can learn about the pathways that cause diseases in humans as well as ways that you might be able to interfere with that. And so um, what I was going to tell you about today is some of these pathways. Um, we've, I've got one message on that, which I keep going back to the same message. I keep thinking I'm learning something new and I'm learning new stuff about the old pathway. Okay, so, so first I wanna sort of illustrate by with this model, the real, you know, the remarkable ability of the fly to um, reflect human disease, um, to show you the features of this. And then what I was going to um, show you our work very early on, um, emphasized um, a pathway that's called the cellular stress response. And I'll explain more about what that is um, and the good parts of that and the bad parts of that. And so, um, um, so we generated um, modifiers of the disease in the stress response and then our later studies that I'll tell you about have revealed to us a whole new part of the branch of the stress response that's important um, for that. Okay, so when we started um, making models for disease. Um, we first generated sort of, you know, this little framework for degeneration. And so this is sort of illustrating, um, so here's a protein. This is supposed to one end of the protein and the other. And the disease that we started to model was a polyglutamine repeat disease. Um, and in these diseases, the protein has an amino acid that's glutamine, and that region of the protein becomes expanded out in the disease. Okay, so, um, so these are, there's nine of these different human diseases um, in humans, and they're, they're these expanded polyglutamine diseases. So this repeat sequence that encodes the glutamine gets expanded out too long in humans. And in fact, the polyglutamine diseases fit into this much larger class um, of human diseases called um, the, the trinucleotide repeat diseases. So fragile X is also this class of disease, but the mechanism is different. So there's nine diseases that are caused by this. Um, so we reasoned, okay, so here we've got that protein. In this disease situation, there's a physical change to that gene. You get too many glutamines in it, um, in the gene. And then that protein is thought to undergo this abnormal aggregation, and that's supposed to show that. You know, this protein misfolds or it folds in a funny way, and that is somehow causing neural dysfunction and death of those neurons. Okay, so we said, okay, let's put in to the fly, we're gonna put in a protein that has a normal length of these glutamine repeats, okay? And so for the disease that we picked, so in humans, 
our length of these repeats can be different in different individuals. And for the, the gene that we picked, it ranges between 10 and 40. And so we happen to have one that had 27 of these in it. And then we also put in a second gene. So in a second set of flies, we put in a different gene um, that had this, it was all the same except now that number of glutamines was much longer. So this of a 78 is on the very high end of disease. So individuals who have a repeat that long will have an early onset disease. This disease is associated with an ataxia. So it causes, um, it works um, by disrupting in the cerebellum and causing a movement disorder. Okay, so when we put this into the fly, we express the normal protein, and this is actually what a normal fly eye looks like. Okay, so we actually didn't see any difference. This normal protein works, I'm expressing it here, and often I'm gonna show you expressing in the eye, just because it's so clear to see the phenotype, um, what it looks like. Um, so this is actually completely normal. This eye has no phenotype at all. It looks like just a regular normal eye. But remarkably, when we put in the disease one that's associated with disease in humans, we got a very different effect. Okay, so this eye looked very um, degenerate. Okay, so changes in this eye include that there's, this eye is missing the pigmentation, so there's something wrong with the pigmentation of the eye. The eye actually has a lot of these black necrotic um, patches on it, which we didn't expect. Um, and then when we section through the brain of the fly to ask what's going on, um, what we could see is that the cells were gone that were supposed to be the eye cells. So despite the fact that this animal has an external eye structure there, there's nothing underneath the surface of that eye. Okay, so if we look at a regular section, this is just showing the outside part of the brain, and these are um, retinal regions, so-called optic regions of the eye. And this is what's right underneath the eye, the retinal region here in normal. Now this is the fly with the disease. And what we can see is these inner optic regions look pretty normal, but there's just debris left here underneath the surface of the eye. Um, and so that indicated that there was a dramatic effect on these cells. Okay. Now looking at this, we already knew that um, obviously these flies are born with an eye. It's just not normal, okay? Um, and in fact, when we looked in the structure of the eye, we can actually see, you can't see them here, but the axons of the neurons are still present there, but the cell bodies are just blown away. There's nothing there, okay? And moreover, we knew from other studies that if we express this gene in the eye and it kills the cells right away, then these flies would actually be born with no eye. Okay, but they are in fact born with an eye. And so that told us that when we turn on this protein actually, the neurons are pretty good for a pretty long time and then they must undergo degeneration because they're born without any eye cells in there. Okay, so that said, it's sort of uh, um, where even though we're turning it on at a particular time, they're dying later. So it's a late onset death just like in the human disease, right? The people have that mutant gene the whole time during their life, but they get the disease um, in, their, um, in their 40s to 60s or later. Okay, the other thing that we saw, which is sort of hard to see here, but um, is that the disease protein, not the normal one, the normal one was just present in the cytoplasm, I call it diffuse, it's just present there. But this disease protein was making huge globs in these cells, okay? So this protein was undergoing this misfolding, okay? So this property that's seen in the human patient tissue is a property of the protein, right? And we're recapitulating that in these eye cells. Um, and moreover, so these are eye cells. These cells are completely alive and completely fine with that big glob in there, okay? They actually die later. 
Okay, so this protein is building up. It's not being degraded properly. It's building up into this big glob. Okay. Okay, so, um, so this was a little time course um, of this development, of this um, disease process. So I'm representing here from the time the egg is, is laid, okay, and then actually flies go through a number of different larval stages, and then they undergo a pupal stage, and then the adult is born at 10 days. Okay, now in this situation, we're controlling when we turn on this gene. Okay, so I'm actually, we were actually turning it on at this stage, right when eye cells are beginning to become eye cells. Um, and so that's why I'm saying this is the onset of expression. And actually, we could tell that it's, ten, that it's um, about 12 hours later when we first start seeing these abnormal accumulations of the protein happening. Um, and then actually we followed these animals and they're fine until several days later. And it's several days later, now here is when we're first starting seeing problems, right? And then these, uh, these animals are born with that very severely degenerate eye. Right, so that told us that the fundamental features, if we were to imagine, if we were to give an animal polyglutamine repeat disease, um, we might expect it to have um, the features of a late onset and progressive degeneration. And by golly, these flies have that. Um, and in fact, these flies will continue to undergo degeneration in the adult. Okay, so the disease is completely progressive um, in the animals. Okay, so this told us like this um, remarkable thing that the fly is displaying these fundamental features of human polyglutamine repeat disease. Um, so the difference is it takes decades for this to happen in humans, right? And we can give this to flies in 10 days. Right? So we can put time on our side to try to understand how this disease gene is acting and how we could interfere with that process. Okay. 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 So having made that, and I have to say that, you know, um, we just sort of did it for fun. It seemed like a really cool thing. And, and um, um, because I wanted, you know, I care about human disease and I wanted to do something that, you know, I wasn't sure if you look at fly models, how much do they reflect the human disease? Well, let's just put in a human disease gene and then we'll know it's the human disease. And I actually didn't think it would, you know, I didn't think it through <laughs> to think it would be such a remarkable reflection. But I got completely hooked because this fly is unlike any natural genetic mutant that there is in the fly. So we've given it these properties that are so reflective of the human disease, and we could now study them in the fly to learn about this. Okay, so now I want to talk about, you know, what did we discover? Okay, so when we got this, okay, we, we did this in part because we wanted to apply the power of the fly to this, right? And how can the fly tell us um, about things? And so, you know, given that this was expression of a human disease gene, we actually didn't know completely. Um, you know, I wasn't sure that we were ever going to get genes in the fly that would affect this. I didn't know how it would work. Um, so we did two approaches at the time. One is we launched into genetic screening. Um, but the other thing is we tried to come up with an educated guess of what could interfere with this. Okay, so given that this protein appears to undergo a structural change, so it makes these big globs in the cell, um, we reasoned that maybe it was possible that there could be a role for other proteins in the cell that help proteins that are folding wrong. Okay, and these are known as molecular chaperones. So they are proteins that help to help proteins fold into the proper shape. Um, they can also, classic molecular chaperones include proteins known as heat shock proteins. So these are proteins that come on in stress when proteins are misfolding and they can help proteins fold properly. Because proteins need a lot of help in the cell to fold into their proper conformation. Okay, so we said, okay, well maybe 
molecular chaperones are making the proteins do this or whatever. Okay, so we ask first, is there any reason to think there might be a role for chaperones? Okay, and so what we did is say, okay, let's just see if the chaperones are there. And so um, this is looking at expression of a tissue that shows the polyglutamine protein. You can see these big aggregates. And this is the most powerful stress-induced protein, heat shock protein 70, HSP70. It's 70 kilodaltons. And actually, all of these inclusions <laughs> that are forming with this protein are labeling for that. Okay, so normally HSP70 is not on, okay, and it is not present that way. And yet it is seeing there's something wrong with this protein, and it is going to that protein. Okay, so that told us that there seems to be something, that cell is detecting that this protein is abnormal, and it's trying to fight that protein with adding a chaperone, put it into the right structure. Okay, so that raised the question, okay, the animal is detecting it as abnormal. What's going to happen if we just give the fly more HSP70? Maybe it's trying to fight it with that. Okay, and in that, what we did then is we made another fly. We made a fly that expressed actually the human HSB70. We took a human chaperone protein and we expressed it in the fly and we co expressed it together with the disease protein and we asked what would happen in that situation. And to our surprise, we found an incredible suppression of that phenotype. So those flies, the external eye was completely rescued back to wild type. Okay, so these animals here um, are still expressing that disease protein, right? Only now they also have added HSB70, right? And so HSB70 is an incredibly profound modifier of the toxicity of this protein. Okay, so we've taken this in a few directions. Um, this was really surprising. This is one of those results where you're like, you set the cross up wrong, go back and redo it <laughs> because they look like the control, right, in terms of that. Um, so, in the f so the question is, how does, this, how does this work? And so one of the things that we did is we said, okay, one reason to use the fly is to ask more about what's going on in the human. And so we went to human tissue, and nobody had actually looked for chaperones in these diseases in humans. And so we did it by looking, the disease we actually picked, because we had a lot um, of tissue of that, was Parkinson's disease. And in fact, the accumulations that happen in Parkinson's disease are indeed labeling for molecular chaperones. And that's just like the fly. Okay, so we looked at these features. This suggests that um, the same things that may work in the fly may be working in humans because of this. And then others actually showed, they then said, okay, um, if HSP70 is part of this um, process, then it's possible that if you have HSP70, um, changes in HSP70 that make it not work as well, those could be a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. And in fact, this group found that to be true. So they found some changes in one of the human HSP70s that when you take that gene and you put it in cell culture and you shock the cells, the protein doesn't come on as much. Okay, so that suggests that indeed not, in, not good HSP70 could be a risk factor that could be leading to these diseases. Okay, so what's my point now? Okay, okay. Okay, so for us that was a real um, amazing <laughs> finding because here we had modeled in the fly, we'd shown that HSB70 makes a difference, and now we felt like the fly has a real contribution to make because the fly can now find genes and pathways that could interfere in the human disease. Um, so another question you know, that we have and that we think is telling us is, you know, how is it that these chaperones are working? What does this tell us about the pathways that lead to disease? Um, and so um, we've made a few findings along that route that fit with those discoveries um, that I told you. So one of them is that when we take these flies and we add more HSP70, that added HSP70 is going to that protein. 
Okay, that suggests that that protein needs more HSP70 than the cell normally has. That's why the HSP70 is working. Okay, so that tells us could it be that normally we're not, there's not enough of this activity? Okay, is too little chaperone activity, not enough of this activity to help buffer these bad proteins? Is that causing neurodegenerative disease? Could that be one of the mechanisms? Um, and in fact, we got um, data to suggest that when we made an animal, so this is expressing um, a bad HSP70 in a fly, and I hope you can see that this fly has a really messed up looking eye. In fact, superficially to me, it looks like a very severe degenerative disease. Now this animal is not expressing a human disease, it just is expressing a very bad HSP70 that's interfering with all the HSP70 in the cell. And so in fact, if we in, interfere with endogenous activity like this, we can mimic, we can get neurodegenerative disease. Okay, so this to us suggests the possibility, both the model organism data that we have, as well as the data from the human Parkinsonism, um, Parkinson's disease data, that, too, that maybe one problem here is that there's too little molecular chaperone activity, and so one would want to boost that molecular chaperone activity. Okay, and we th I think about this in this. This is not a very good, well-drawn neuron, but if here's a neuron um, with its um, projections and its, um, and its axon, and now this protein, this abnormal protein in red starts accumulating in this cell, and the cell is going to try, the neuron is going to try to fight that, and so it's going to send chaperones to that protein, but the, our idea is that there aren't enough chaperones, and so what ultimately happens is that all the activities in the cell that require chaperones, and note that Protein folding requires chaperones, okay? So for all the different activities that the cell needs, it needs molecular chaperones. And in this situation, you've got this bad protein accumulating. It seems to us like the cell is actually sending the chaperones to that protein, and so it's neglecting many of its um, other functions. And because of that, it's going, um, it undergoes this slow strangulation um, of degeneration. And that by giving the animal more HSP70, we can help protect against um, lots of those, um, lots of those um, phenotype, lots of those effects. So this sort of led us to believe that an insufficient, not enough um, of this stress response can lead to degenerative disease, and boosting this um, can be protective. Okay. So now I wanted to tell you one other little story because it illustrates an, a number of different things, including a completely different aspect of the stress response um, that we think is involved in memory and, um, and in Alzheimer's disease and prion disease as well as ALS. Okay, so um, the thing that we started doing um, um, when, so this is how you do a genetic screen in flies. So in addition to, you know, I showed you this example where we guessed um, what was going on, but we can also take these flies with the disease and mutagenize them and look for flies that are, um, restored back towards wild type, right? So that's the way to just, without guessing what's involved, let the fly tell you what might be involved. And that has actually revealed um, a lot to us. Um, and in addition, um, one of the things that we've done, because as I mentioned, um, it looks like all these different diseases have protein misfolding, we're interested in are there commonalities? Can we find things that are going to work against all of them, not just um, one of them? Um, and so, so that is this, you know, do these different diseases share pathways um, that are involved? And the disease that we got interested in because of that is ALS. So this disease that's a motor neuron disease, again, these are motor neurons, the big neurons that control our movement in the spinal cord. And there was this um, in incredible insight into TDP43 
I'm sorry, into ALS, when um, also at Penn, some researchers um, found the protein that was accumulating in these abnormal aggregates in, in nearly all ALS across the board, and it turned out to be this protein TDP43. Okay, so the protein is normally in the nucleus, and it becomes, um, it gets spread out into the cytoplasm and then accumulates um, in the cell. Um, and this was very important um, because it suggested that there might be common mechanisms leading to ALS because nearly all ALS is characterized by the same pathology, um, just like Alzheimer's disease is characterized by its own pathology. Um, and they also found rare mutations in this protein. Okay, so this turns out to be a different kind of protein. Um, it's an RNA binding protein. And so um, um, I think this won't work, but let's see. No, okay. Okay, so as part of our... Um, Part of our studies, right, we were interested in making models for other things and then other diseases. Whoops, I didn't want the sound on. So my student is. Uh, okay, so this is showing um, we made a model for this ALS type toxicity. Um, let me show it to you again. Usually I have it looping. Okay, so these are normal flies. And f normal flies have this negatively geotactic response, so they climb upwards. Um, and these flies here are flies that are mutant for this protein TDP43. Now, those flies are alive. They just have a very severe mobility defect, so they're not climbing there um, in terms of that. So, um, so you can see that the phenocopy of some of these um, diseases um, can be really quite remarkable. Okay, so um, we were um, studying t this protein. So if you express TDP43, I think, you know, it's hard to see here, but the eye is nearly normal. It's not as dramatic as polyglutamine. Um, and we were working together with a yeast lab. So it turns out that you can model human neurodegenerative disease in single cell organisms like yeast. Um, and so they, in three months, you can do a screen for genes that interact in yeast. And we were working together with our colleague, Aaron Gittler, and he had a list of genes um, that he said, these are genes that interact with TDP43. Let's test these and see if any of them work in the nervous system. Um, and that's why we use the fly. And one of those genes was a gene um, called ataxin 2. Okay, and so what we found with ataxin 2 is that if you express ataxin 2, um, there's very little effect. But if you expressed both TDP43 and ataxin 2, you get this very severely degenerate eye. So we saw this interaction between these genes. Okay, so we thought that might be important and we looked at it in more detail. Okay, and so, um, so the next study we did was to say, okay, we're going to look at flies that survive when we express it in the nervous system. This is a normal lifespan of a fly. It's a little shorter than usual because it's higher temperature because we're so impatient. Um, and here's with TDP43, they're dying very early. Okay, if we give these animals um, more ataxin 2, um, they actually die much faster. That's consistent with the, the synergy. And yet, if we just express ataxin 2, there's actually no effect. We don't see much of anything. Okay. However, we became really interested because the fly has its own copy of ataxin 2. We said, okay, let's just lower ataxin 2 a little bit. Okay. And if we do that, we found that we could extend the lifespan of these flies back towards normal, back to nearly normal. Okay, so if we just drop the level of ataxin 2 by 50%, which has no effect on its own, we are mitigating the, the toxicity of TDP43 dramatically. Okay, so this told us the function of this gene is really, really critical for TDP43. Okay, so we reasoned, okay, what could this mean? Okay, and the reason we were interested in that is that we were interested in this gene ataxin 2 because ataxin 2 was already a known human disease gene. Okay, it just wasn't an ALS gene. It was in a different disease. Okay, so we thought, could this interaction mean that actually mutations in ataxin 2 should also be found in ALS? Okay, and so the reason we thought that 
Okay, so here's, a, here's an example of, here's atoxin 2. So atoxin 2 is actually a polyglutamine disease gene. It has this repeat, this glutamine in it. Okay, and when that glutamine becomes expanded out, that causes a disease that causes spinal cerebellar ataxia type 2. So it causes a cerebellar problem, again, this ataxia. Um, but if we looked in the literature, we could see that there were examples where the same mutation in that gene can present very differently. Okay, and in fact, sometimes it can look like it has Parkinsonism, okay, which is a lack of mobility, right? And sometimes it looks like it has ALS. So a loss of motor neurons. Okay, so we reasoned, you know, could it be that <clears throat> polyglutamine expansions that are greater than normal, but less than enough to cause a, this ataxia, could these things be causing ALS? Okay, and in fact, that's what we found. So we screened over 900 um, controls and 900 ALS patients, and indeed, expansions in ataxin 2 are associated with ALS. Okay, now one of the things about human disease is you want to know um, that you're comparing your changes to the right background population, right? So if you have you know, if you're comparing um, Europeans to um, South Americans, you could see differences that are really just due to differences in the background and not actually due to real differences. So what's striking about the expansions in ataxin 2 um, is that after we reported them, they've been reported in every population across the world, and expansions in ataxin 2 are a risk factor for ALS in all the populations that they've been found across the world. So European, um, Middle Eastern, um, Asian, et cetera. So these data tell us um, that this is an ALS disease gene, and I'd like to emphasize that this finding came from yeast and flies, right? And in fact, um, um, so this suggests, these data tell us that not only is ataxin 2, could it cause ALS, but we actually think normal activity of ataxin 2 is very important to causing ALS. And that means that ataxin 2 could be a target to lower its activity in disease. Okay, so what does it tell us about ALS? And that's where it comes back to the stress response. Okay, so here's the thing. TDP43 is a nuclear protein normally, right? Um, and ataxin 2, though, turns out to be in the cytoplasm. So it's in a different part of the cell. Okay? So when would, atox when would TDP and ataxin 2 normally interact? Okay? So it turns out that the time when TDP43 goes into the cytoplasm, which is what you see in the disease, is stress. Okay, so TDP under, if you take regular cells under heat shock, it will go into the cytoplasm where ataxin 2 now is. Okay, so, um, so we think that cellular stress, some kind of a stress now, is promoting the interaction between TDP43 and ataxin 2. So both TDP43 and ataxin 2 will accumulate in the cytoplasm. Okay, now, um, what we think they're accumulating it, and this now is becoming a theme about ALS, could be these um, structures that are known as stress granules. Okay, so um, what are stress granules? Okay, so what happens in stress, okay, is that a cell um, is in an emergency situation, and it detects that there's things that are wrong, and it wants to stop making all those proteins that it should normally make and turn on proteins like chaperones. It wants the helper proteins there to help things go right, and then when the stress is over, it wants to go back to its regular proteins, right? So it needs to deal with this emergency and then go back to normal. So in stress granules, stress granules are the accumulation of mRNAs that the cell doesn't want to make while it's under stress. 
Okay, so it is shutting down the expression of those things. And normally, the cell will recover from that, and those will go away, and the cell will go back to make what it wants. But what one hypothesis for ALS is that for some reason, there's a, either a sustained stress or these proteins go into a conformational state so that they never release. Um, and because that, because of that, you, those structures that form may be pathological stress granules. And so the cell is stopping to make all the regular things that it needs to make in order to function normally. Okay, so it's undergoing a sustained translational, that's making protein repression. Okay, so we think this sustained cellular stress can lead to degeneration, and what's interesting is that this same mechanism has been implicated in memory formation um, and Alzheimer's disease. So it could be that these sustained stresses and then shutting down of the proper proteins that are required for normal function is going awry for some reason so that you need to reprogram the cell um, back to its regular state. Um, and this, these pathways, there's a lot of theories that it's these kinds of pathways that also are contributing to aging. So things are going wrong with aging on top of the fact that it's believed that neurons basically don't have a very good stress response. Okay. So the kind of work that we're doing, and I'll um, nearly end here. So we interplay the fly with human pathology. Um, so for example, we showed that ataxin 2 is also mislocalized in ALS and some of the downstream situations. So we interplay between these systems um, in order to understand more about human disease and see if we can identify pathways that could be targets for interference. And the major message um, that we've learned is that a properly regulated and controlled stress response is a good thing. And I'd just like to um, end by saying that, you know, I've given you an illustration of how you can use the fly for a neurodegenerative disease, but the fly is now being used for many, many different applications that are relevant to human health. Um, and so, you know, the I, uh, the disease here, this is really true, it's limited solely by the creati creativity and innovation of the scientific community to apply um, the animal um, to these questions. And finally, I'll just thank my wonderful lab for their devotion to this, and of course we thank the patients and their families who make our work possible. Um, and that's what I was going to say about my work.